Sorry, class first. Remember, class first. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians ten. Five. Five. Yeah. Anybody know it? <laughs> what were you supposed to memorize? <laughs> As we go. <laughs> I would look. I would we are destroying. What? What um version are we learning it in? Uh, whatever one you like. Mine. Well, right. <laughs> I, I had my Bible in the ASV. Oh no, this is Old King James. Old, 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 old King James. Second so, <laughs> Corinthians ten five. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay. So where we left off last week, we didn't quite finish chapter two, and I wanted to just say one or two more things about that, and then. Uh, Show you a quick video that I think is interesting. So we were talking about, like, the, well, actually, let me ask you guys, what what was the whole point of chapter two? Like, what, like, what what's the gist that he? And he actually says it at the end of the chapter. I mean, it was kind of, you talked about like meaning, <laughs> meaning of life and things like that, or like, uh, like, yeah, like that, the what and why of our existence. Right. So, like. What, remember the parable of the madman? What are the, what's the reality of life if God doesn't exist? Right? And remember, because the madman came in and he's like, where's God? And they all laughed at him and they were like, oh, did you get lost? Yeah. And and so he's like, I'll tell you where God is. He's dead. And he starts listing off all the, like, this is what it means if there's no God. And, and he said that they didn't get it yet, right? It didn't come to them. And so we talked about, like, even these four fundamental questions of life. If there is no God, we got here, it's time plus chance plus matter, right? Some, like Bertrand Russell said, the accidental collocation of atoms, which that doesn't even explain things. And that's what we're going to get into later today. We get to chapter three. But no one knows how we got here. There is no real morality, which is a whole chapter later on in the book, but there's no such thing as good, bad, or right, or wrong. Because who or what decides what's good, bad, right, or wrong. It all becomes it's subjective, right? We talked about objective versus subjective. It all becomes subjective, which is to say that it doesn't really exist. You just make it up. And there's no real meaning. That's what we talked about a lot of the time last week. There's no real meaning or purpose to life. You can make one up if you want to, if that makes you feel better, but it's just pretend. There's no, like, we're, there's no rhyme or reason to our existence. There's no real end to things. We talked about how ultimately we're all going to die like individually and collectively in the heat death of the universe. So like, who cares what you do? And, and, and if death is the end and when you die, you just cease to exist, then why shouldn't I just live my life to maximize my enjoyment in the short time that I'm here? Like, why should I do anything that doesn't maximize my pleasure in this life? Right. That, that seems to be the most rational thing to do. But again, the whole point is like, Bertrand Russell said, again, we read that thing called a free man's worship. And he said, only on the unyielding, he said, only on the uh, foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Well, that's uplifting, isn't it? <laughs> that sounds great. So we were talking about that sort of, of thing, right? Any, any other things that you thought about, like in the last two weeks that you wanted to kind of bring up? I want to just hit one or two more things quick that I thought about that we didn't really talk about. What do you think about all this stuff? I think I was uh, reading a Calvin and Hobbes once. It, it, it's a lot of them are like really deep because one of them he's like he's just in school and he's so bored and then he's like, "Why am I here? This is the only life I'll ever get." And then he tries to run out of the door, but the teacher catches him. <laughs> all right. So you're but that's... forced to live a life that. Right. We don't even want to live. Do you think that most people even think about these things? I mean, maybe, maybe it for like brief moments, but that's what, that's the other thing I talked about last week for the people who weren't here. Like, here's God's reality. Like, if there is a God, this is what things are really like. But there's two groups of people. The one group we'd said, we, we called it the dilemma pole, who they realize, like the madman, what it means if there is no God. And so they just live with this like inconsistency in their life. 
like they know that there really are differences between good behaviors and bad behaviors and there really is a right and a wrong and there really is meaning and purpose to life but they can't make sense of that because they don't believe in god so they just live with that inconsistency so you have those people and then i said that most people are probably over here and most people that i interact with are over here the, the, like the, that's Oz Guinness said this he calls it the diversion pole because they want to affirm all of these things right they want to they want to be kind of in the god realm but they don't want the god part so they just distract themselves so they don't have to think about it right and so that's what i mean when i say most people like when they do think about these things then it's like oh i don't want to go there i don't want to go there like, oh you know and they just kind of dismiss it or they they take their mind off of it and they do other things like we like everybody knows that they're going to die like except the, the lord comes back but they don't want to think about it right like if i always think like somebody if someone were to yell like in a building nobody's getting out of here alive everybody would panic but it's true it's just a matter of time right <laughs> like eventually we are all gonna die but like people oh, no. like but like you don't think about that because you're like it's far away i don't have to think about it but they don't want to think about it right it makes them uncomfortable and so that's kind of the stuff we talked about i wanted to just say one or two more things they quote this uh on page 44 uh, in the book, there's a quote from Steven Weinberg, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And he writes, he, did you read this quote? He says, it's almost irresistible for humans to believe that we have some special relation to the universe, that human life is not just a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents is reaching back to the first three minutes. But that somehow we are, were built in the in from the beginning. It's very hard to realize that this all is just part of a, a, just a tiny part of an overwhelming hostile overwhelming hostile universe. I can't read. I have to, I'm fighting. I have glasses in my pocket. I'm like I'm fighting the urge to put them on because I don't want to admit that I can't see. <laughs> it's it is even harder to realize that this present universe has evolved from an unspeakably unfamiliar earlier condition and faces a future extinction of endless cold or intolerable heat the more the universe seems comprehensible the more it also seems pointless but if there is no solace in the fruits of our research there is at least some consolation in the research itself men and women are not content to con to comfort themselves with tales of gods and giants or to confine their thoughts to the daily affairs of life, they also build telescopes and satellites and accelerators and sit at their desks for endless hours working out the meaning of the data they gather. The effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things that lifts human life a little above the level of a of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. Now, again, Craig goes on to point out that tragedy is not a neutral term. It's an evaluation of the situation and saying that that's a terrible situation. I wanted to add this quote because if you look up uh, Steven Weinberg, you'll probably find this quote. And th this, he said this, I personally, this is that same guy, but I, this is what I want to get at this morning. And it's why people don't want to believe in God. Because oftentimes there's a reason for it. And here's what this guy says. I personally feel like the teaching of modern science is corrosive of religious belief. And I'm all for that. If science scientists can destroy the influence of religion on young people then i think it may be the most important contribution that we can make well that's interesting isn't it think about what he just said he wants to destroy the faith of young people through scientific research and again i i, I think that there are good scientists that can undermine all the bad scientists however that's interesting to hear that and uh did you read the story of like William Lane Craig, how he came to become a Christian? That's interesting. But he also, uh, I wanted to read this too, because they, I think he talks about Thomas Nagel in here. I don't know if I wrote down where it is, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Let me read you this quote. This is Thomas Nagel. He's an American philosopher. And this is what he says. I hope there is no God. I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true, 
and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that the re- hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. My guess is that this cosmic authority, sorry, my guess is that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition and that it is re- responsible for much of the scientism and reductionism of our time. You know what scientism and reductionism is? It's like we talked about with materialism, like that everything's just made of matter. And if we do reduce it to its most basic parts, it's just matter and there's no supernatural, right? And what's he, what he's saying there is it's that that's responsible for these belief systems because people don't want there to be a God, right? He says one of the tendencies it supports is the ludicrous overuse of evolutionary biology to explain everything about human life, including everything about the human mind. This is a somewhat ridiculous situation. It is just as irrational to be influenced by one's beliefs by the hope that God does not exist as by the hope that God does exist. So like, if you listen to that, why does he want God not to exist? Did you catch it in there? He said it's the cosmic authority problem. What's that mean? The cosmic it's authority people problem. People don't like to be held responsible for what they do. Uh, yeah. They, uh, and, is it like they don't want a leader or something? Or they don't want, a, well, because it's authority, they don't want someone ruling over them? Right. That's connected, right? They don't want to, they don't want to be told like what to do. That goes all the way back to where? Adam and Eve Eve in the Garden of Eden. Remember the serpent? If you eat the fruit, then you'll be like God and you'll know good and evil. And so what they were actually saying is I'm going to be the one to decide who's right and wrong, what's good and bad, right? That's we wanted to play God. And so people don't like it when they know that there is a God over them, because that means that you're not the boss. And that ultimately, you're not the judge of things either, that you're going to be held accountable, that when you die, you don't just get away with things, that there's somebody that's higher than you that's going to sit and open the book and say, oh, what did you do here? I know what you did. And here's the consequences of that, or here's the reward of that. Now, in light of that, I wanted to share this video because, again, uh, we don't live in a, like, you know, we live in the world. And uh, I, I just want to be as real as possible with you guys, because that's kind of the whole point of this, to be able to defend what you believe and share it with other people. But I wanted to show you this clip. This is from a guy named Frank Turek, who has an organization called Cross Examine. Yes, sir. What's your name? Rusty Black. Hey, Rusty. How you doing? Good. 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 Uh, I had uh, kind of an application of an apologetics question. Uh-huh. So obviously we prepare ourselves. I think most people in here, you know, they have a lot of atheists and pretty much believers. Uh, not so much your family. You know, you pray for your family. You have a lot of opportunities to talk to them. Uh-huh. Uh, and maybe not somebody that you see every day at work, but the passerby. Or, right. uh, obviously we need to prepare ourselves, read learn from people that do this for a living. Uh, how do you draw the line between we were, we took a trip and we were talking about you, we were driving and you, kind of, you have a good attitude when you talk to people that are illogical, they have these illogical views. Uh, how do you draw the line between winning an argument and reaching the end goal of pointing people to Christ? Like, you know, you're you're talking to somebody and it, and it kind of, they kind of take it in a bad way. Or, mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you decide? I mean, can you talk to people all the time that are just random crew people? Yeah, I think I drive that wedge. I think that, first of all, Greg Coco, my friend, has a great book on this called Tactics. I don't know if you've heard of that book, but it deals with all of these interactions you have with people and what questions you should ask and how you should deal with people when they get upset and all this. And one of the things that you might want to say if someone gets upset was just say, um, well, first of all, the question I think you should ask when people get upset is if Christianity were true, would you become Christian? Because there seem, this, this seems to be 
more emotional than it needs to be if there are not emotional reasons for you to get upset. In other words, why would you get upset when we're trying to talk about facts as to whether or not God exists? Because there's a whole cadre of implications that flow from the question of whether or not God exists. In fact, let me be very blunt with you in here. Not that I haven't been so far. But I submit to you that a lot of the hostility that Christians experience, and it's mild compared to what they experience in other countries, but a lot of the hostility that Christians experience in America are, they're experiencing it because there's a new religion in America. And the new religion in America is the religion of sex. It's an old religion resurrected, no pun intended. And what I mean by that is, is that you notice the, the battles that we have culturally, they're all surrounding sex, right? Abortion, same-sex marriage, now it's contraception that have to be paid for in the Obamacare and all this. It's all these cultural things. It's all about sex. And the University of Nebraska wants to keep Chick-fil-A out of their, uh, or at least some students do, off their campus because the CEO believes in traditional marriage. The, the, the reason I'm saying this is because the elephant in the room for many people is not evidence. The elephant in the room is morality and accountability. They don't want there to be a God, and they don't want you, if you're a Christian, to impose your morality on them. That's why there's so much heat. That's why there's so much aggression. That's why people will shout you down and get mad at you, because they think you're going to try and take away something they don't want taken away. That's really the issue. There are so many implications that come from this. It's more political than it is intellectual. You guys disagree with that? That's really the elephant in the room. So I think when you're dealing with people on that, they all get hot and bothered and they get angry with you. Um, you just, you don't want to go there with them. You just want to be calm and say, maybe we can talk another time. I'm sorry I upset you. And then, you know, go to somebody else. Uh, but Greg Kokel's book is great on this. And I'd highly recommend you get it. Just let me give you a few questions you can ask people when they say things. These are from his book. The first question is, what do you mean by that? Like, for example, Mr. Carpenter asked me the question about evolution. Do you believe in evolution? My first question is, what do you mean by evolution? It means so many different things to so many different people, right? you got to define your term. Second question is, how did you come to that conclusion? Somebody says evolution is true. Oh, macroevolution is true? What evidence do you have for that position? What's your best evidence, right? Third question is, have you ever considered? Have you ever considered that the evidence that could be used to point to a common ancestor could equally be used to point to a common creator or common designer. So those three questions, what do you mean by that? How do you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered can help you move a conversation forward? And you can see if a person really has evidence for their position. Many times they don't. They've heard a slogan and they just believe the slogan. And when you press them and what evidence do you have for that slogan? They don't, they don't have any. So I think look, reading his book, and some of the tactics, by the way, are in the app, too, that you can download the Cross-Examined app. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, these questions you can use for anything. Anything. Parents, you can use them with your kids, right? You can say, hey, uh, you know, your kid calls you one night and says, I'm not going to be home at 11 for curfew. First question should be, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Second question is, how do you come to that conclusion? <laughs> Third question is, if you're not home by 11, you're grounded for two weeks. Be right home, Dad. <laughs> by the way, husbands never use these, uh, never, never use these questions with your wife. If she calls you an idiot, don't say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> she is going to have a list a mile long. <laughs> Especially if you say, how did you come to that conclusion? <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so that so that brings us to and uh, yeah, that brings us to the, the the first positive argument now that we're going to present for God's existence. And so the the first chapter is going back to the first fundamental question: origin. So why does anything at all exist? Like, which is an interesting question. And if you're uh, kind of bored and you have nothing to think about. Try to think about the concept of nothing, right? Like, because we say nothing, and oftentimes when you hear people say, like there's a guy named Lawrence Krauss who debated William Lane Craig numerous times, the guy who wrote this book, 
and uh, he's a astrophysicist, and he he's a very smart guy, but he he uses the word nothing. But when he uses the word nothing, he doesn't mean nothing. He means something, and nothing is nothing. Oh, so see the guy who's like nothing, just black. Is that him or is that another guy? Uh, it was like just blackness. No, that was something else we were watching. Yeah. But like nothing is nothing. Like there's no space, no no material, no time, like nothing. Like so God existed alone. But I mean, even think about it, nothing would be no God too. Like nothing. There's nothing. Right. So, but that's not obviously that's not true because we look around and we're here. So then, like, it makes sense to ask the question, well, why are we here? So what are our choices when we think about why we're here? And this is where Gottfried, well, this guy also was the co, I guess it's not inventor, discoverer of calculus. So at the same time that Isaac Newton figured out calculus, he did, this guy's a German guy. So they both get credit for calculus. So when you're enjoying calculus class, you can think back to Godfrey Wood on Leibniz and say, thank you. I'm having a great time with this. The derivatives are great, right? It's fun. So what are the two options, he says? With every, so I'm, what I'm saying is since we're here, either we came here because we were caused by something before us, and we don't have to be here, or we have to be here. So the first thing, if we're if we're if we don't have to be here, we're caused by something else. There's a word for that. What is it? We exist. It means depends on something else. Starts with the C. Contingently, right? So either things exist contingently, or if they have to be here, they exist. Necessarily. necessarily. So do any of us exist necessarily? Do you have to be here? If your parents never met, would you be here? If you're actually here, oh, there's a family that used to come to the assembly here. They have a picture in their living room of the Mayflower. And, and it's the picture of the, I forget the guy's name, but he fell off the boat and then they rescued him. And so I saw it in their living room and I was like, wow, is that the Mayflower? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I was like, well, that's cool. And she's like, you know why we have that painting? Because I'm a descendant of the guy that fell in the water. <laughs> so if they wouldn't have saved him, she wouldn't be here. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's crazy. But think about all the things that had to happen. Like we, we usually go back to like maybe our like great, great grandparents, but then we don't think much before that. But like, we are all descendant descended from people who lived thousands of years ago and like think about it like if somebody would have just fell off a cliff or got ran over by a horse or something we wouldn't be here right i mean there's a million things that could have happened that like trickle down through generation after generation to get us to be here so we're all contingent uh does the earth have to be here no does our solar system have to be here no does the whole universe have to be here no, the, and then what he's going to talk about too is that even, so you can look at it from the, the macro level, the whole universe seems to be contingent, right? It doesn't have to be here. And, and there's good philosophical reasons, which we'll get to at the next chapter, for why we know that it wasn't always here. And there's good scientific reasons that why we know it wasn't always here. So it wasn't always here that it had to come into existence. But even at the micro level, like what he's going to talk about is like, even when you break atoms down to like quarks and things like that, like, could you replace one quark with another? Like, does that particular quark have to be here? No. So it seems like everything that exists, exists contingently, right? It doesn't have to be here. So then now we ask, okay, that's really weird. Why is it here? Because if it doesn't have to be here, how did it get here? Following all this? All right. So let me show you. This is, uh, Craig made this video up. Well, he didn't do it, but he had it made. Have you ever wondered why it exists? Why does anything at all exist? 
Gottfried Leibniz wrote, the first question which should rightly be asked is, why is there something rather than nothing? He came to the conclusion that the explanation is found in God. But is this reasonable? Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. The universe exists. From these, it follows logically that the explanation of the universe's existence is God. The logic of this argument is airtight. If the three premises are true, the conclusion is unavoidable. But are they more plausibly true and false. What kind of an argument is this? Remember? Oh, oh, oh. Is it inductive or deductive? Deductive. Deductive. Deductive, right. The third premise is undeniable for anyone seeking truth. But what about the first premise? Why not say the universe is just there and that's all? No explanation needed. End of discussion. Well, Imagine you and a friend are hiking in the woods and come across a shiny sphere lying on the ground. You would, naturally, wonder how it came to be there. And you'd think it's odd if your friend said, there's no reason or explanation for it. Stop wondering. It just is. And if the ball were larger, it would still require an explanation. In fact, if the ball were the size of the universe, the change in its size wouldn't remove the need for an explanation. Indeed, curiosity about the existence of the universe seems scientific and intuitive. Someone might say, if everything that exists needs an explanation, what about God? Doesn't he need an explanation? And if God doesn't need an explanation, then why does the universe need an explanation? To address this, Leibniz makes a key distinction between things that exist necessarily and things that exist contingently. Things that exist necessarily exist by necessity of their own nature. It's impossible for them not to exist. Many mathematicians think that abstract objects like numbers and sets exist like this. They're not caused to exist by something else. They just exist by necessity of their own nature. Things that exist contingently are caused to exist by something else. Most of the things we're familiar with exist contingently. They don't have to exist. They only exist because something else caused them to exist. If your parents had never met, you wouldn't exist. There's no reason to think the world around us had to exist. If the universe had developed differently, there might have been no stars or planets. It's logically possible that the whole universe might not have existed. It doesn't exist necessarily, it exists contingently. If the universe might not have existed, why does it exist? The only adequate explanation for the existence of a contingent universe is that its existence rests on a non-contingent being. Something that cannot not exist because of the necessity of its own nature. It would exist no matter what. So, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. But what about our second premise? Is it reasonable to call the explanation of the universe God? Well, what is the universe? It's all of space-time reality, including all matter and energy. It follows that if the universe has a cause of its existence, that cause cannot be part of the universe. It must be non-physical and immaterial, beyond space and time. The list of entities that could possibly fit this. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment. So, do you follow what he's saying there? So if, if we're talking about the universe, we're talking about everything that there is. So time, space, matter, energy, all that sort of stuff. So whatever the cause would, would be, would have to be outside of that. So when you, but if you take like the, uh, 
there are there are some religions that remember you said when we break it down it's it's either god made all god is all or no god at all never talked about that so all the god is all religions that would fit into that category they have a problem right because if everything like if the whole universe is contingent and it hasn't existed forever then how did it get here because if we're all part of this kind of energy the force or whatever you want to call it right that means that that force or whatever it was has to exist outside of the universe it has to be separate from the universe but their whole concept is that it's it, we're all one right like you become one with the brahman or whatever right like that you're all you become one you reach nirvana or whatever but see the problem there it's because somehow you have to get outside of that so there has to be something that's not connected with the universe. So if the universe, so that's why it's important. If the universe began to exist and there was nothing before it, well, I can't say nothing, right? Because there'd have to be some cause because it's contingent, right? So there has to be something that's there, but that thing couldn't have started to exist, right? So that's why they said it must exist necessarily, which is to say that it can not not exist. Like it just is. And it has to have certain attributes. Does that make sense? And so, that, so what are the what are your possible options here? And that's what he's talking about. You either have God, or an abstract object, like like they're just talking about numbers or things like that. This description is fairly short, and abstract objects cannot cause anything. Leibniz's contingency argument shows that the explanation for the existence of the universe can be found only in the existence of God. Or, if you prefer not to use the term God, you may simply call him the extremely powerful, uncaused, necessarily existing, non-contingent, non-physical, immaterial, eternal being who created the entire universe and everything in it. It's just his first name. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, this is so. This is called natural theology when you when you kind of think like these, like we're, what we're doing here, and this ties in with what we read in Romans chapter one, where it says uh, in verse twenty: For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So think about it, just from this argument. That we've been talking about we're able to pull all these attributes out of god which is pretty amazing isn't it so it tells you like god so like when sometimes you'll hear people say that there's a whole kind of farcical kind of quad like i don't know if they it's like a, they're mocking religion but they call themselves pastafarians they believe in the flying spaghetti monster so you know how people sometimes they have like the fish bumper thing right the little thing in there so sometimes you'll see people and there's like the flying spaghetti monster there and it's like two googly eyes oh i think i think yeah. i've seen I've seen and so that they're mocking that they're like well because they're what they're mocking is that people they'll say it's god of the gaps right so if you don't know the answer you just say god did it right so they're like well, why does that have to be god why can't it be the flying spaghetti monster well could it be the flying spaghetti monster because what's spaghetti made of yeah. Matter. <laughs> but matter is not eternal, right? So it can't be the flying spaghetti. You see what I'm saying? This stuff works, right? You're like, okay, I understand what you're trying to do. That's clever. But the flying spaghetti monster isn't a possible candidate for the creator of the universe because he's made out of matter. Do you have anything else, right? Do you have another option? Now, one of the things quickly I wanted to show you, like he, he draws all these these arguments out. And by the way, like I said, I have these, like, this is Leibniz's argument. I have it written in my Bible and memorize it. Like, so this is what I would recommend for you guys all to do. Because when you're talking to somebody about this stuff and it comes up, because it does, believe it or not, you'd be surprised. Like once you get a handle on this stuff, it comes up. You want to be able to just kind of, oh, naturally in the flow of conversation. So do you think that there's a God? Or somebody said, well, what evidence do you have that God exists at all? Well, do you think that the universe has always been here and does it exist necessarily? And then we're off, right? Then you keep going. Now, the one thing he didn't say 
And we'll, this kind of ties in with the next chapter, which is the Kalam cosmological argument, uh, which talks about having a beginning to things. But one of the things you can pull from these arguments, this one and the next one, is that God is personal. So not only is he timeless, spaceless, unimaginably powerful, necessarily existing, you know, timeless sans creation, but he's also personal. How could we come to the conclusion that God is personal based on the idea that God created everything? Any thoughts? Because I got another video. I like your video. <laughs> well, I, I think, like, why should you listen to me explain it when I can have the guy that wrote the book explain it? So let me show you this quick since we're running out of time. These are like the riddles when you, you, you like, someone tells it to you and you, like, you can't think of the answer. And then when they tell you the answer, you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So someone asked him this question. <laughs> The next question is, um, and it's going back to a question that uh, we sort of skirted around, and maybe we need to answer yeah, this. Must we do. God be personal? All right. Let me try to summarize briefly three arguments why I think that the cause of the universe must be personal. First reason would be causal explanations can be either of two types. It can be a scientific explanation in terms of laws and initial conditions, or it can be a personal explanation in turn. So the explanation, if it's scientific, would mean that it is by definition contingent or determined? Contingent, right? Because it's caused by material effects of an agent and his volitions. So, for example, if I walk into the kitchen and see a kettle boiling, and I say to Jan, why is the kettle boiling? She could say to me, because the heat of the flame is being conducted by the copper bottom of the kettle to the water, causing the molecules to vibrate more violently until they're form thrown off in the form of steam. Or she could say to me, I put it on to make a cup of tea. Would you like one? One is a scientific explanation, the other is a personal explanation. Both of them are equally legitimate forms of causal explanation, and in some contexts, one would be utterly inappropriate when the other would be appropriate. Now, when it comes to a first physical state of the universe, there cannot be a scientific explanation of that in terms of initial conditions and natural laws, because it is the first physical state. There is nothing prior to it from which you could deduce it by natural laws uh, uh, based on prior conditions. So the only kind of causal explanation that's available will be an explanation in terms of an agent and his volitions. And that gives you a personal creator. Second reason, the cause of the universe, as we've seen, must be timeless and spaceless uh, and changeless. Now, there are only, and immaterial, and therefore immaterial. Now, there are only two possible candidates that I can think of that could fit that sort of description. Either an abstract object. If there's, do you follow what he's, why, why, why do you throw an immaterial there? Because material cannot exist before material. Oh, you're almost there. <laughs> Material. You have to create. You have to. Material has to be created. Well, and it exists. Contingently. It it's not eternal. <laughs> <laughs> this is made of matter, right? Yeah. And it exists in space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because once you have matter, then it has to exist somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'm, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but you got to think about some of these things, right? So matter it always exists in space. So space and matter kind of are connected. So if you don't have any space, you can't have any matter, because where would the matter be? It would be immaterial matter, like that doesn't make any sense. Right? A number, a mathematical entity, these are timeless, spaceless, immaterial, or else an unembodied mind or consciousness, a mind 
without a body. But there's the rub. Abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. That's definitive for what it is to be an abstract object. And therefore, things like the number seven, for example, have no causal effects upon anything from which it follows, therefore, that the cause of the universe must be an unembodied mind or person. Uh, so that would be the second reason. The third reason is that it's the only way in which you can explain how to get a an effect with a beginning from an eternal cause if the cause is sufficient to produce its effect then if the cause is always there and is permanent then the effect should be always there as well for example if the cause of water's freezing is the temperature being below zero degrees celsius then if the temperature were below zero degrees from eternity past it would be impossible for the water just to begin to freeze a finite time ago. Any water that was around would be frozen from eternity. If the cause is there, its effect must be there as well. So how do you get a cause which is permanent and eternal and an effect like the universe, which only began to exist 14 billion years ago? The only answer to this conundrum, I think, is if the cause is a personal agent endowed with freedom of the will, who can therefore create a new effect spontaneously without any ante antecedent determining conditions. For example, a man sitting from eternity could freely will to stand up, and thus you would have an effect with the beginning arise from an eternal and, and permanent cause. So for those three reasons, I think we have very powerful grounds for thinking that this is not simply an uncaused first cause, but this is a personal being, a personal agent, which has chosen freely to bring the universe into existence. All right, so we're running out of time here. So let's just close, we'll wrap that up. So read chapter four for next week, okay? Lord, we just thank you again for this time that we can think about these things. We thank you that you have revealed yourself through creation. We thank you that we can know you and that you've uh, especially shown us who you are through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that everyone would uh, know him as their Savior and Lord. And we just pray for your blessing on our class and, and help us to be a light and a good testimony for you as we interact with our friends and, and family and acquaintances that we would be able to show them uh, who you are through uh, our love for them. And so we just uh, help, pray that you would give us wisdom and we would be light and salt. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.